so ibrutin has been uh, this, the first in class BTK inhibitor that has the longest study history, and we know a lot about its uh, long term clinical outcome as well as uh, the safety profile. And now there's also the new generation, the second generation, more selective BTK inhibitor, such as a calibrutinib, which recently received FDA approval. So for example, the Elevate TN trial, which is reported in uh, ASH 2019, uh, has compared acalabrutinib versus acalabrutinib plus albinutuzumab versus chromacil plus albinutuzumab. So this three-arm study has demonstrated, similarly to the first-generation BTK inhibitor, that acalabrutinib either using alone or in combination are superior to the chlorambacil plus albinutuzumab combination in progression-free survival. Uh, interestingly, even though the uh, um, previous study in Alliance uh, showed that when rituximab is added to abrutinib, it did not seem to show much benefit compared to abrutinib alone, in this study, in the Elevate study, the addition of albinutuzumab to a calibrutinib actually shows a small uh, benefit in progression-free survival when compared to a calibrutinib alone. So I think that's an interesting new information we learned. So the second generation uh, BTK inhibitor with the acalabrutinib, and there's some others that's uh, on the market but not yet approved for CLO. Um, so those are all newcomers that uh, are more selective in BTK and has less off-target effect and uh, has the potential of uh, hopefully reducing some side effects associated with the BTK inhibitor. Yeah. We have had chemoimmunotherapy. Um, and there's been, uh, there was a randomized trial looking at clarambucil monotherapy versus clarambucil rituximab versus clarambucil obinutuzumab. That trial ultimately showed improvement in outcomes with obinutuzumab over obin uh, rituximab plus clarambucil or clarambucil monotherapy. Now we're seeing more data recently with, as you say, three-arm randomized trials with BTK inhibitor-based therapy with either rituximab or uh, obinutuzumab. Um, I wonder if maybe I can get Stephen's uh, opinion on or what the current thought is on CD20 antibodies and CD20 antibodies in addition to BTK inhibitor-based therapy. And is there a superior antibody or does it add to the BTK inhibitor-based therapy? So um, in, in general, when we're looking at ibrutinib trials, it, it's, it's difficult to find a substantial uh, benefit by adding um, um, uh, rituximab or rituxan to ibrutinib, um, but um, the, the Elevate TN study, which looked at the combination, as Dr. Schwer mentioned, of abinutuzumab with uh, acalabrutinib did show a, a PFS benefit. The, the, the reason may be that um, ibrutinib has uh, inhibitory action against uh, TEC and ITK kinases, which may impact on antibody dependent cytotoxicity, but it, it may also be um, the nature of the antibody. So abinutuzumab is, is, uh, seems, seems to be a more potent antibody, it induces higher rates of MRD negativity than, than rituximab, so it may be using a strong antibody with a, with a, a BTK inhibitor which uh, has less uh, inhibitory reaction on perhaps one of the main mechanisms of action of the antibodies, a sensible combination. So the, the question, certainly in Australia, will come down to a cost-effectiveness question, um, whether or not the added benefit of adding an antibody uh, warrants it. And, and it's not just a, a cost uh, question, there's also um, a, a, a safety and tolerability. So there is increased rates of neutropenia, potentially increased rates of infection if you com combine uh, multiple agents together. Um, Certainly with abinutuzumab, there's risks of infusion reactions, so there's, there's, a, there's a cost, uh, both financial and also in terms of side effects with the combination. So I think the follow-up is also very short, so it's really difficult to know where these will fit in, but it's encouraging data. Yeah, I really, I, I, I have to say, I, I feel very much in agreement that, that, that it's too early to say that the abinutuzumab clearly adds, and it's a real shame that they 
that the study was designed in such a way that they didn't intend for the two arms to be compared with and without antibodies. So the study isn't powered for that endpoint, which is an endpoint that everybody is so interested in. And obviously, hindsight, maybe they didn't recognize at the time that everybody would want to know this. When you look at the ibrutinib of inituzumab arm of the Illuminate study, clearly those were quite a high-risk patient population. You're not allowed to do tr cross-trial comparisons, but it doesn't really appear to be a you know, they certainly didn't do any better with the antibody. And so I think that without strong knowledge that the antibody truly does add, we can all feel comfortable using a calibrutinib without a vinituzumab. And again, community treaters don't have to feel like their choice is between uh, a combination that inc includes IV therapy, it's awkward for the patient, it's much more difficult to give. Um, I think you could look at either BTK inhibitor as monotherapy and only if the data proves strong with time because it is very short follow-up at this point and the curves really seem to be separating right around the point at which the median follow-up is. I don't know that that's the most confident uh, time point to make that decision. So there is clear data that doesn't support rituximab very clear, with yeah. BTK inhibitor and I think everybody, I hear a consensus that everybody's mm -hmm. interested in looking and seeing more follow-up and are comfortable with BTK inhibitor-based therapy that's monotherapy, either ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, um, and are not real enthusiastic about combination therapy with CD20 antibodies. No, and, and the rate of um, infections was also much higher in the combination yeah. strategy, so I, I would be hesitant to recommend it, you know, to anyone. The one issue is that the ECOG A1912 study had IR as the investigational arm. There was no single agent ibrutinib, so while we haven't been able to show a benefit adding rituximab to ibrutinib, um, it's very hard when you're deviating away from the trial and someone who you wanted to say use FCR. Uh, it, it, I, I'm not sure you can then say single agent ibrutinib is adequate because that trial hasn't been done. Yeah. So now that you mentioned that trial, that trial was really the only large phase three trial that's shown an o overall survival difference. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could comment on that and what the current thought is about that difference that's being reported with few events. So, so, so um, there's been a small number of events. So the, the ECOG E1912 was a, um, a trial in FIT, uh, patients that were eligible for FCR-based therapy and it compared FCR with ibrutinib with rituxan or rituximab and uh, the, it met its primary endpoint which was progression-free uh, survival and there was also a small difference in overall survival. Um, the, there was still, there was a few progressions but I, I think from memory roughly half of them were due to progressive uh, chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. Um, my, my at, at the moment, um, it, we, even with the update at the ASH 29 meeting, there's still a benefit for the um, investigational arm, the ibrutinib rituximab, but follow-up is short. And we know with drugs like ibrutinib, over time, there's an accumulation of um, uh, toxicities, there's uh, hypertension and atrial fibrillation and bleeding. And so whether or not with further follow-up, when you're getting some of the patients who favourable patients with, who receive FCR, uh, you might see the, the curves uh, flip. At, at this stage we haven't seen that, but I think particularly in the favourable patient with mutated immunoglobulin gene and no adverse other biological features, I, I think the question is not answered.